Hi, welcome to this second clip on this week's lecture on materiality and practice, uh, which you can also think of as the week on the kind of Marxist anthropology or, um, and its influence in subsequent developments within anthropological theory. So in this clip, I'll do as I do every week, uh, introduce you to what I think is the core idea here. And the way that I've uh, kind of tried to present it in this slide is in contrast to the diagram that has been guiding us since the beginning of this course, if you remember the opposition between universalism and relativism, which if you remember distributes uh, similarity and difference according to the distinction between nature and culture, and relativist positions, as you see here on the left, um, see a distance between different cultures and the nature that underpins them, whereas on the right, universalist approaches see the continuities that an underlying cultural similar, uh, sorry, natural similarities guarantee uh, to kind of ameliorate cultural and social differences that anthropologists might be interested in. That whole way of thinking, according to materialist approaches, is fundamentally wrong. It's an, actually a bourgeois ideology that the society in which we live in has persuaded us uh, is a, a, a good way to think about similarity and difference. Uh, but crucially, from a materialist point of view, the reason why all of this is false consciousness, if you like, an ideological construct, is that in pretending that human beings um, can be characterized uh, in terms of the ways in which they think uh, or see the world, recall, for example, the lecture last week on culture, cultures as different world views, ignores the fundamental way in which human beings don't merely see or think about the world, but actually act within it. Human beings, according to materialist approaches, need to be understood fundamentally as actors who engage physically in relation to the material conditions uh, in which they are born and which they do not themselves fully control. So if you like, what's happening, and I'm showing this on the kind of slide on the right-hand side, what's happening here is that the realm of nature, if you like, is totalized uh, and comes to include within it those things that we would call human cultures and societies, because human cultures and societies are part of nature, but nature is not that neutral thing out there upon which we take a perspective as human beings and see it or think about it, but is itself an evolving process that is fundamentally historical. So the world around us, the material resources which we engage with and on which we draw in order to be able to survive in this world, and we ourselves as thinking, acting organisms are all in a process of becoming that is what we call history, right? So we belong to the world around us, to nature, because nature and we alike are historical. It, it, nature itself differs from, it, from itself as it develops through time historically, right? And it differs because human beings operate within and upon it, right? So if you like, nature and humanity are bound in a kind of neutral relationship. And that neutral relationship is historical becoming. And that historical becoming is fundamentally embedded in the material conditions in which human beings operate and act. So this is the fundamental insight of a material approach um, in the social sciences and philosophy and social theory, but also in anthropology more specifically. So the core agenda of a materialist approach in anthropology focuses on the following kinds of questions, right? First of all, it focuses, as I say, on the material conditions in which social and cultural phenomena emerge and exist. Societies and cultures are not these free-floating um, webs of meaning, for example, as Clifford Geertz said, but rather need to be understood as fundamentally embedded in material conditions, right? And these material conditions are not only biological and environmental, they are that too. So our species characteristics biologically, the environmental conditions into which we're born are fundamentally materially important to us, but they're also economic, right? And this is because labor 
and this is a concept that in these approaches is often understood in a very broad sense, is the fundamental manner in which humans and nature relate. I am involved in the historical becoming of the world around me because I interact with it, because I work upon it, right? I need to labor in this world in order to secure the resources and the wherewithal, wherewithal that I need in order to be able to continue existing. And that relationship of labor means that I'm deeply intertwined also in an economic sense with the material conditions that give rise to my particular positioning in the world, right? So not only questions of nutrition, of human ecology and of livelihood, but also questions of distribution of resources and who has the power to control those resources are fundamentally interesting to material approaches in anthropology. This question of power and its unequal distribution, right? So this immediately raises questions of inequality, of exploitation and of conflicts within history and society, right? So people uh, don't have their material conditions guaranteed, right? And that means since those conditions are not guaranteed and we need to labor for them, that means that immediately the possibility of inequality uh, and therefore also exploitation of some human beings by other human beings and therefore also of dynamic tensions and conflict immediately arises. So approaches such as these really emphasize historical dynamics uh, and the emphasis on is on the potentials for transformation of material conditions, right? And the goal of the approach is to explain social and cultural phenomena, if we're anthropologists, with reference to these underlying conditions and dynamics, right? I would say, harking back a little bit to some of the skepticism that I expressed in the first uh, clip, and this is, of course, my own uh, opinion, but nevertheless, I think it's fair to say that because of this um, kind of tendency to explain society and culture with reference to underlying material dynamics, there's often a, tr a tendency towards reductionism in materialist approaches in anthropology. Remember this question of reductionism that we discussed when we were talking about Durkheim in the second lecture and his uh, kind of anti-reductionist stance. He wanted to see social phenomena in, of them, in and of themselves rather than reducing them to, in his case, underlying psychological explanations. Here we have a tendency to make a virtue of reducing things to underlying mechanisms and particularly uh, a tendency towards economic determinism, right? So the ideas, as, as I was saying in the previous clips, that people carry in their minds are froth that really are just expressions of underlying economic relations and economic dynamics, right? So there's a fundamental general premise to materialist approaches in anthropology, and that is this kind of idea that material stuff, materiality, is somehow more real than other things that we might be interested in as anthropologists, and therefore furnishes the ultimate baseline for our ability as anthropologists to explain uh, social and cultural phenomena. The material is the most real aspect of the world. So here are some of the core questions that we might ask about materiality in practice if we adopt this kind of approach. Here's um, some typical questions that, you know, anthropologists who ask these questions kind of tend to fall into a materialist uh, camp uh, within the discipline or within anthropological theory. What are the important resources in any given social context and who controls them? What social fault lines does this create? What are the fault lines of opposition, of conflict, of exploitation in, in any given society, right? How are these fault lines expressed locally? And how is the broader regime of power that underpins them and that is at stake in them legitimated, right? How can we understand this historically? Materialist approaches, because they're interested, as I said from the beginning, in seeing uh, humanity and nature embroiled in a process of historical becoming, are always interested in diachronic emergence of the phenomena that they're looking at. They take a fundamentally historical, some, some, some might say historicist approach. And how do these dynamics fit within broader global currents of a political uh, economy seen on a larger canvas. So even if you're looking at a very specific uh, instance or a particular society or cultural um, phenomenon or development or, or case study, as a 
materialist anthropologist, you'd always want to want, want to look that in in its in its broader context of the kind of big currents of economic and and political and social history. Questions of colonialism, of capitalism, of neoliberalism always feature in these kinds of of approaches within anthropology. Through what social, economic and political arrangements uh, and practices does this regime get reproduced over time, right? Um, and what dynamics of change are there in these uh, uh, developments and how are these expressed? These are all the kinds of questions that a materialist anthropologist is interested in asking. Okay, so that's the core uh, idea for this week, the core approach. Uh, just to give you um, um, a kind of sense of the, the, the clips that follow, I'm going to start with a clip in which I basically give you the rudiments of uh, Marx's thinking. Um, and that's, of course, uh, something that we could devote a whole course to. So I'm only going to give you a very, very, very brief kind of flavor of what Marx's thinking involved, and particularly with, with reference to the concepts that have had an influence within anthropology. In order then, in a, a further clip, to give you some brief examples of Marxist uh, analysis uh, in anthropology. Uh, then a, a further clip will look at certain other uh, approaches that are allied with Marxism within anthropology. Um, and uh, but are not strictly speaking Marxist in themselves, but are kind of influenced by him. Then I'll have a clip on some criticisms, as I always do. And then I'll have a little supplementary clip, an extra little clip, where I'll talk about softer versions of materialism, non-Marxist approaches that are also materialist in various other senses of materialism, which see things, objects, as constitutive of social life, rather than determining and i'll explain a little bit more about what i mean by that in in that clip so we've got a fair number of clips this week uh, but i hope that they're going to be uh, shorter in duration so i won't overburden you with too much to watch so see you in clip three